Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Laura. Laura, welcome back to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Always very happy to be to be here talking with you. Finally, yeah. very inspiring. Yeah, well, I feel like we could talk for hours, but I won't do that to you or to the listeners, mm -hmm. viewers now. Um, but we were talking before I hit record about how I got a lot out of your guided meditation. Um Laura does hypnotherapy and helps work with the mind and mindset and all that good stuff. I want to read on your, on your Instagram, it says solutions for self-doubt and self-sabotage because life is too short to spend battling your inner critic. I was like, yes, please. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to get to all that, but um, yeah, so we were talking about meditation. I loved your meditation and I feel like I do better with guided meditation because my brain has a hard time focusing. Otherwise, I, I feel like I have a harder time reining myself in. So you can say what you said before I hit record. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say, don't, don't worry. You're not alone. Yeah. We are all in it together. And um, it's easier to be guided because otherwise we have a part of us that tend to censor all our own good ideas. So when I when I see my clients, I always spend a little bit of time explaining how the mind works. And to make a long story and very interesting story short, we have two main parts of the mind. We have the conscious mind, which is very logical, and the subconscious mind that is deep, but is based, it's also a little bit robotic. And it's where all our programs are, our um, reaction, our habits are there, our beliefs are there. And we can't control it with the conscious mind. It's, it's all regulated by the subconscious mind. And then there is a little portion, little, but I find it like at the bottom of the subconscious mind, <laughs> if we want to have a, an image of it, we have a part that I'm not sure how to, um, how to name it yet. I think is the real us. So for you, Don would be the real you, your your true self, the you you, the real mm -hmm. you. This is where your intuition is, your wisdom, and we access at times at this part of us. You know when you are, maybe you are doing something else, and you have insight like, oh yes, I'm gonna do this now. Mm -hmm. It's such a great idea, and then a second after. No, no, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Who do you think you are to do this and to that? No, 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 no. And so we have this habit of censoring our good insights. And the insights come from that real you, from that wisdom, inner wisdom that we all have. And it's a bit like um, what we should actually do. Our potential, right. ideas for our potentials are there. They emerge but then if you're not quick enough to grab them, it's like, no, 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 we can't do this. So when we are guided into a meditation practice, it's a little bit easier to avoid the censoring. Okay. And that's why we go a little bit deeper. We could do it even if we are not guided. But, you know, for instance, if I, if I tell you my experience, this is my job. I do this all the time. I... I meditate a lot, but when I ab I'm able to access my true self without being guided, even by my own recording sometimes, <laughs> is when I have like migraine or I have something physical that takes me a little bit away from uh, the life outside. So I'm already, uh, I'm a bit spaced. Then in those moments, I have big insights and I grab them. <laughs> it's interesting. I that find is it very interesting. Is that because the migraine is forcing you to be in the present because it's just there? Oh. Never, never thought about this. It could be actually. <laughs> it could be, but it's more like when I, when the pain is so strong that you go a little bit somewhere else to 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 manage the pain, mm. to, to cope with the pain. And so you go a little bit deeper. If your mind is free to think, also your logical mind, then the censoring goes on. There are a few techniques to avoid the censoring, being guided, 
Mm -hmm. but also when we have insight to say them out loud <laughs> so they become real it's not just a crazy idea i had in my head you say them out loud okay said it loud oh, okay <laughs> this is one way another way which i really like and i was actually recommending this to a client of mine this morning um it's writing so if you journal mm -hmm. you journal and it seems that to avoid the sensory, you need to journal at least um, three pages, for three pages, which more or less correspond to 750 words. So you write down 750 words or around three pages. And then you get to the point where your sensory habit just <laughs> quiet down a little bit. And you can have big insights when you do that. So for those people who like to journal or who like to explore journaling, that could be a very good technique. And I like to combine this with listening to, um, now, of course, it doesn't come to mind, but you know, the <laughs> bits that help you to actually- Oh, oh yes, yes. Oh, oh like the, the hertz and uh, the um, micro, or not beats, beats, binaural, binaural beats. Thank you. That is it. By Nora Vint. It only took 50 other words. <laughs> but at least you remember, since this morning, I'm trying to remember by Nora Vint. <laughs> so you listen to by Nora Vint, and for the by Nora Vint, you need to wear headphones or, or earphones because it's, the sound is slightly different left to right. And then you write three pages, then you have insights. So... I think it's even better when you set an intention before, like, but what is what is the answer to this question? What should I do in this situation? And you're not asking someone else. You're asking yourself, but your true self, your wise self is going to give you an answer that is not, um, you know, is it, not censored by your beliefs, <laughs> the beliefs right. you have about yourself especially the limiting beliefs you can actually see the potential in yourself and you have also the ability to distance yourself a little bit from what is um challenging for you in that moment because when you when we are too much into it we are not very clear we need to get a little bit of distance and sometimes when we are in a situation it's not that easy Right. And when you're saying to journal, it's not like, dear diary. I mean, you're really just like writing whatever word comes to mind. Right. Because I've tried yes. to do it one time and I've heard some mm -hmm. people really benefit from it. If they just do it every day, don't pay attention to it. Nobody's going to see it, you know, just write, just write, write, write. And it does come pretty quick. You, you would think you'd get stumped. It's kind of more stumped at starting. But then once you start, then it just, yeah. You the gates. Mm. So the, the moral of the story is that we need to be asking ourselves, our higher selves, our inner selves, any questions that we have, quit looking to outside and trust our inner, our inner voice. But our yes. inner voice is so tiny. It's so quiet. <laughs> and you get censored every time. So it, it takes some training probably to start listening more to our own intuition. Uh, we need to train ourselves for that. Trust yourself, do like um, inner self work, journal, listen to guided meditation, start becoming more aware of your own self-talk. And yeah. that little voice, that tiny, sweet little voice um, so I think it, the very good practice is to say out loud those great ideas that come, even if they seem a little bit crazy at times. I can do this. Oh, I'm going to call this person tomorrow and ask for this. I think it's a good idea. No, I can't call this person because, ah, so you say, I'm going to call him. I'm going to call her. Okay. I actually said it. I thought about it and then you can choose whether to follow your own advice or not. <laughs> yeah. What is the critic? Who is that? Is that, uh, 
an a parent that said things to you to make you doubt yourself? Is that what is it protecting you? What is it? Where is it coming from? <laughs> it's protecting you. <laughs> so it seems that our mind is almost blank when we are born. Then there are different school of thoughts and theories. Mm -hmm. I think is not completely blank because anyway, at least when we are in the womb, something we form some kind of beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, but essentially when we are born, it's almost blank, let's say, and right. we need, to, we need to create some kind of map of how to move through life, through situations. And we create this map by creating, I call them programs inside our head, our subconscious mind, like, okay, this happens. I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this happens. I'm going to do this, this, and this, and those programs are just you know set of steps to follow and the subconscious is going to 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 make you follow them without thinking because okay. it's a bit robotic so let's say that your protocol says i don't know uh, when i see a dog i'm going to run away then you think but i can't be afraid of small dogs I decide I'm not going to be afraid of small dogs anymore. As small dogs get closer to you, you can't, you can't control it because mm -hmm. the problem says, see a dog, run away. Right, now, right. A super simplified and almost silly example. They are more complicated than this. Um, but for instance, you know, a lot of people think they are shy. But then when I talk to people that think are shy, everybody's shy in a completely different place way some people are shy one-to-one -one. others are shy in group of people like because being shy doesn't really exist it's not a trait of personality it's a program you believed probably somebody that said to you that you were shy you yeah. accepted the idea and then you started behaving as a shy and then you think about oh, i am shy and you start uh, thinking that this is who you are but this is just an example, shy. It can be being loud. It can be funny. It can be smart. It can be dumb. It can be anything. Right. How we, we, we decide, we believe what we hear and those labels just stick with us and they become a program. And somehow maybe we accept that the idea that we are shy and with it, it protects us. Oh, sure. So those programs are protecting us. We create them to protect ourselves so that we are not going to suffer anymore. So it depends on what kind of experiences you had and what kind of ideas you had in your mind where you had an experience and so how you judge that. And the thing is that most of the programs form when we are um, children, when we are um, up to six, seven years of age. So imagine how immature we are when we create most of our programs and, they, and these programs keep running unless we do some work. Um, and sometimes they create blockages and limitations that we are not meant to have. Gosh, I never thought about it like that, that those uh -huh. are beliefs that we either made up or were told about us or whatever, when we were five or six years old like what in the world why would we think that that is something that has to stick with us for our entire life and it could have just been a comment from some little old lady or something that just was like oh they must be shy they're not talking to me they're shy and then that <laughs> kid just takes it like but it is part of your identity too though if people say, oh, you're so funny, then you just take it and you're just like, oh, I'm the funny one. I'm funny. Everybody has confirmed it. And you don't think that there's any other way. You never sit mm -hmm. and try and dissect it, I guess. Yes. And you know, there are some people that think, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to say to my kids that they are smart. You're so smart. Oh, well, done. so smart, so smart. But this is not working either, because if a little kid thinks that they are so smart because, I don't know, they do something silly because they, they are they are young right. and they grow up, but nobody's going to tell them, oh, you're so smart because you draw a tree. Oh, and then they think, oh, I'm not good enough because 
not smart, not smart enough. So if they make a mistake, if they do something sure. that is not smart, they're going to feel very bad about themselves and failures. So the best thing is never label anyone. Label the action, but not the person. But even the best parents <laughs> right. are not the only ones living around the kids. And so it's a bit of a lottery. What goes inside the subconscious mind and what doesn't. You can do your best, but at least it's a little bit of lottery because you have other grown-ups, other kids, the popular kids at school, which usually are very cruel, um, and other um, other factors. Right. <laughs> so it also depends, you know, something happens and the way you react to a situation depends on what's your mood that day. Are you in a good mood or are you in a bad mood? Have you had enough food? Are you tired? Especially <laughs> when you're young. So if you're tired, you're in a bad mood and somebody does something to you, for you is oh, a big traumatic event. Maybe if you had enough food, enough sleep, it was nothing. Yeah. yeah. So it's a bit of a lottery. And I think it's very important not to blame anyone and any anyone and any situation is just um, work on it. And what I really love about my job is that just a few sessions and you can get free from limiting beliefs, like if you never had them. Wow. If you, you, if you want, uh, say you don't have um, access or you're not quite mentally ready to go to somebody that's a hypnotherapist, what can you do yourself? Is it a matter of like, can you squash a thought if you sit there and you look in the mirror and you say, you know, oh, I, I just wish my nose, I hate my nose. I wish it was this or that. Like, do you stop? Do you, do, you, do you start doing talks saying the exact opposite or what do you do? Oh, this is so interesting, your <laughs> question. <laughs> so um, first of all, never squash a thought. Never try to destroy it or not to have it because it's already there. Okay. I think that when we try to um, destroy an emotion because every thought produces an emotion, you're bottling them up and they yeah. will explode at some point it's better i like to say it's a bit like if we have two doors on one door the the emotion uh enters in but you need to leave the other one open otherwise they are stuck in and if you don't allow anger sadness frustration or whatever uh, they're going to consume you <laughs> they are they they are very valid emotions as much as joy and satisfaction etc the whole range of emotions is important to us but society makes us think that we can't be sad and we can't be angry no we can and sometimes it's not <laughs> right so this is one thing the other thing is that huh other two things sorry <laughs> one thing is the importance of being in the present moment and probably approaching a little bit of mindfulness work could help uh, the only thing that exists is the present and we tend to ruminate a lot about the past or to imagine a very catastrophic future but actually the past you can't change it even if it was bad you can't change anything the, the possibility to change is just in the present mm -hmm. and the future is not there yet you can plan it very good but then you need to open <laughs> to different right. terms so when we are present we can also catch ourselves thinking about things that probably are not true. Most of our thoughts are very habitual thoughts. Mm -hmm. We tend to think about the same things every day. And most of those things are negative, imagine. Right. <laughs> what is in our head? So most thoughts are the same as the thoughts you had an hour ago, an hour earlier, the day before, but also most of them are negative. Now, I can't remember the percentage on top of my head, but it's a big percentage. Yeah. So it means that all these negative, repetitive thoughts are visiting our mind so much that I think that we don't hear them anymore. It's like a background noise, but we listen to them. That's the problem. We think they are true. They are facts. So when you practice a little bit of mindfulness, you 
you come to understand that these thoughts are only mental events and not necessarily they are facts. They are not true. They are just mental events, just repetitive thoughts. And so instead of squashing them, you can say, ah, yes, hello, you. <laughs> I'm not enough thoughts. Okay. So it's a bit like uh, you say, oh, hi, door is open. Goodbye. <laughs> you okay. can let them move. So this would be the best thing. Um, but what struck me was your example of, oh, I have a bad nose and... So imagine a friend of you comes to you and say, I'm so ugly and look and my my face is all tired, my hair really bad there, <laughs> my nose, this nose, and I have a pimple just there and you can just see that pimple, just I'm so bad today. Right. I don't think that you are going to say to your friend, yes, of course, you're so ugly. <laughs> Don't go out. <laughs> Don't leave home because you are terrible. You are ugh, disgusting. And the yeah. people there, please just come back when he's gone because I can't even watch you. <laughs> you will never say this, right? Right, never. But what do you say to yourself? That. Yeah. <laughs> what do we say to ourselves? All They're the time. Hard. Always like, oh, you're so horrible. You're so bad. So... To answer your question, I think that the best possible thing we can all learn is to be more self-compassionate. And I end up teaching a little bit of self-compassion to all my clients because we all need it. And the reason why I'm so keen of talking about self-sabotage, self-doubt, it's because I suffered a lot with that. Mm. I, I know exactly what it feels like. Right. Being very judgmental and critical about anything that you do when you're never enough. And this is a bit exhausting. And one of the things that helped me the most was learning about self-compassion. And self-compassion means being compassionate towards ourselves. Society and and... The Western world, but not just the Western world, I think in Asia as well, is kind of strong. But we are taught to be very kind towards others, but not very kind towards ourselves. So if we see someone that is having a challenging moment, we tend to comfort them. We want them mm -hmm. to feel better, which is beautiful. Right. But when we have something that is not that is challenging, we just said, Oh, what are you complaining about? Just go, do. Right. And it, it's a bit like we are kicking ourselves in the bum of the day. Or yeah, just, you know, it's true. And banging ourselves with criticism and criticism. And that criticism that sometimes is a reaction because it's a it's a program in the subconscious mind. Right. Creates suffering, creates pain. And when you feel pain, you that pain needs you need to tend that pain. Mm -hmm. You need own comfort so if you I always think you know if i if i fall down and i scratch my knee and it's bleeding a little bit i may say oh i'm so stupid i didn't watch where i was going but i'm going to put a plaster or to you know i'm going to medicate the yeah. um the bleeding but what about the emotional pain because the emotional pain is as painful as the physical pain so if I feel it's just my fault that I was looking at the phone and I didn't see a hole in the pavement and a fall down and it's just my fault, stupid, stupid me, that is creating pain too. And so it would be good to say, oh, wait a moment, this is difficult for me. It's challenging because I'm criticizing myself, mm -hmm. something that has already happened, I can't change it. So, right. Yeah. So... I'm living a difficult moment. Ah, I'm criticizing myself because I'm trying to be perfect, but nobody's perfect. No. We are living a shared common humanity of never feeling ad adequate. And so, ah, uh, yes, everybody in my situation would feel the way I feel. It's just normal that I feel not enough. 
not good right. enough. Right. Yeah. I wish myself to be happy. I choose to be tender towards myself. And the last bit can make you like ah melt inside. Ooh. And then it's a fresh perspective. That was beautiful the way that you said that. Mm -hmm. Because we mm -hmm. are so hard on ourselves and, and we should talk to ourselves like we would talk to a, a friend or a little child, you know, like it's okay. You know, people fall, we're going to get everything all the way it is. It's okay. And I don't know why we can't give ourselves that grace. I don't know why that is. We all are guilty of it, but being aware of that habit is a good start that it's I know I talk down start. to myself. I need to stop doing that and just have more grace and give myself a little bit more. Yeah. Tenderness, I don't know why we do that. Tenderness. tenderness. Right. You, know, you can even hug yourself when you, when you hug yourself, nobody really understand what you're doing. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> but you caress your arms yeah. and oxytocin is released, which is the hormone of love. And that makes us calm down. It's very, very, <laughs> very strong thing to do. So this is something that you can do. You can just, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Mm. <laughs> you just caress yourself a little bit. You hug yourself. This is already something. And then make sure that you treat yourself with kindness, like you would with a friend. So the key is, can you become your best friend forever? A BFF, <laughs> like it say. Can we all become our own BFFs? Because we are the only people available to ourselves 24 hours a day. Nobody else is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. From the beginning to the end, we yes. only have ourselves. Like, yes. We're the only one that's going to be around us forever. Yes. And I don't think you would choose by choice somebody who criticizes you all the time it right. may happen but you could not imagine that it would end up like this you know so the same be your own good partner that is comforting another example i think that that can hit the nail imagine a kid that is and and he a kid that has a teacher that says oh, you didn't get it again you are just leaving everybody behind. How, how is it possible? You never understand anything. This, let's say, is math, math teacher. And then same kid, same situation, and another kind of teacher, math teacher, that says, ah, uh, yeah, I know, it's complicated. Let me explain it to you again. Don't worry, it's very normal that you don't understand at first. I might have used the wrong word, words don't worry let let me tell you exactly again and i can be here with you until you get it it's all fine it was difficult for everyone who do you think that kid will learn most with right right the caring teacher not the criticizing teacher so somehow we can tell ourselves how can i be my best if i'm criticizing myself or if I am comforting myself, comforting myself. Yeah. And we expect to fail because it may happen. Why? Because we are humans and we can't be perfect. Ah, that <laughs> makes us a little bit softer and we try more. So when we are self-compassionate, instead of lying just on the sofa, we actually are more proactive more productive, mm -hmm. more successful, but we're also more satisfied, more happy. We are much happier and many other um, more, we have more self-esteem and self-compassion is started to be studied by scientists and neuroscientists. And this is the result. Uh, wow. There are so many benefits, so many benefits. If instead you keep criticizing yourself, thinking that the inner criticism is going to push you to do more is not really like this. Yeah. Like this. Well, and it starts with us too. If we feel good about ourselves, we're going to be nicer to other people. And then in turn, they'll be nicer to other people. I mean, it comes full circle. It comes back to you 
also whatever you give out is going to come back to you. Are you reading any good books right now? Anything that's been inspiring to you? Have you been reading or have you been busy? Well, you know, on self-compassion, Christine Neff has written two magnificent books and I recommend everyone to read them. Especially what, how the- do you spell her last name? Uh, Christine with K and Neff is N E double F. Okay. And the book is self compassion. <laughs> oh, that's what, oh, that's easy to remember. <laughs> it's one of the most eye opening books I've read on the matter. Oh, I love that. I love it. And, and your job has to just be so rewarding, just seeing the, seeing the shift from, you know, maybe it takes one session, maybe it takes 12, maybe it takes a hundred, who knows. But when you get to see that moment where it switches and you see the confidence and just the happiness, how rewarding that's got to just feel great. It is very great. And sometimes even the face features change because, wow. And I, I sometimes tell my clients, go and look at yourself in the mirror. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> You're so beautiful now. I like, ah. so yes, thank you. It is very rewarding. I, I, I'm so passionate about what I do and mm, yeah. That's wonderful. Beautiful. Yeah. So I saw like on Instagram, cause I follow you on there and you've been getting, how are you having seminars? Are you having like a Ted yeah, talk kind I, of thing? What are you doing? Yeah, I had one recently and I found it so rewarding. So, um, I was based in London for 20 years and now I, I, I live in Milan in Italy and I still work in London traveling, but okay. and, and most of my sessions are actually online because Zoom works like if we were in the same room. So I have clients from all around the world, but here in Milan, there is a uh, a club for international women. Uh, and so I went to give a talk. It was a bit of a seminar to them and it was very rewarding because these kind of practices are not so well pop, well known and popular in Italy. And so everybody was enthusiastic about the possibility of change because, yeah. because it's a bit of a practical approach. It's not just a, it, it's talking therapy, but not just talking. It's a bit also giving tools and it's a different approach. And that was beautiful. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Well, how is that? Why isn't it? popular there um i noticed that in every country things are very different there are different regulations different kind of therapies or practices that are popular and Mm. and so yeah also you know there's there are a lot of um a lot of wrong myths about hypnosis and if people don't know what it is it It can be scary because some people think they are going to lose control where actually you never lose control because nobody can put any beliefs or program in your mind. Right. But this is the belief because stage hypnosis is like this. It's Oh, sure. They make me act like an animal. Yeah. If you don't want to, at any point you stop. You are always in control. You're even more in control than when you are hypnotizing yourself without knowing which happens every day thinking that you're not enough we're hypnotizing ourselves when we do that yep (laughs) yeah i'm not imagine something this is hypnosis hypnosis is simply to be uh concentrated and imagining things so you know sport uh, athletes Part of the training nowadays is to train the mind to be calm. Very important. Imagine tennis players, for instance, of Mm -hmm. golf players, but also to imagine them succeeding in the future. So they believe in themselves and then most likely they will uh, play much better. The same is for performance, you know, public speakers or people that need to perform or, Mm -hmm. or talk to the public. If they just say to this, oh, I will be terrible, I won't remember anything. Oh, it will be horrible. <laughs> then they imagine this and they are just telling their subconscious mind, which is that part of the mind that doesn't really know if what you imagine you are really seeing it with your eyes or is just in your head. Think that you are horrible and 
how do you think you're going to speak the day after? Like, oh my goodness, it's terrible. Instead, right. you imagine yourself being very cool at ease and war just coming out from your mouth with ease. And there are more chances that you're going to be calm enough to remember everything and to be a good speaker. It's training. You mm. train, you know, athletes train physically, yeah. but they mentally. If you don't do anything with the body, do it mentally. And I don't know if you know, Don, but they put electrodes in, in, in the body and they noticed that when somebody imagine doing some kind of sport, but in details, like now I'm going to move this leg and the other or running or doing things, mm -hmm. actually muscles are working out. Wow. This is the power of the mind, the mind and the body are one. So imagination which is hypnosis basically it's very powerful the mind has a tendency to be negative so unless you direct your imagination you're going to imagine that you're not doing things in the proper way and that means that most likely you are training yourself for failure and hypnosis is only self-hypnosis so an hypnotherapist like me can guide you, but the hypnosis is your experience. Nobody can hypnotize you, hypnotize you really. Right. And guide you self hypnosis. Gosh, that is fascinating. Have you mm. incorporated breathing, breath work at all in any of your yeah. stuff yet? Yes, a little bit, but I want to do it more. I want to study a little bit more breath work. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, it's powerful, but certainly, yeah, breath, yes. Um, calm breathing breathing with the diaphragm yes these are things I I do um, yeah I've I just been it. hearing so many good things about that too mm -hmm. and I know when you're meditating and stuff you're supposed to focus on your breath too but yeah just the whole breath work thing is really interesting so you you um oh my gosh meditate every day how long do you meditate for oh thank you for this question sometimes I meditate for five minutes Okay. And I say this with pride because it seems you need to meditate for hours every day. And in our modern life, that is not doable. Yeah, it's not practical. Sometimes I meditate longer, longer times. And I even change meditation styles depending on what I feel like. Sometimes it's more uh, self-hypnosis, which is fine. You're still work with the brain and not just the mind other times is proper mindfulness meditation um i practice yoga and i try to be very focused mentally when i do yoga so this is a moving meditation mm -hmm. um i think when you have a when you have trained your brain and your mind for meditation then even if sundays is a short meditation is totally fine is when you don't do anything then is not good right so i really i really believe that little bit every day is good and much better than a long session and nothing for a month right right do you so feel like it's the same training as far as uh, the self-talk negative self-talk do you find that the more compassion you show yourself the better you're getting at it and so you're not hearing that critic as much okay that's good to know Absolutely. And then uh, maybe this will be for another episode, but it could be also <laughs> training to notice the positive things that are around you instead of letting your mind to notice just what you are lacking of. Right. It is a mind trick because if you tell yourself, I am so lucky, lucky things happen for me all the time. You will go around and feel like everything is going your way. Everything's going crazy. But if you wake up in a bad mood and just things are rotten, that your day will be that way. It, it's totally true. That's just how it works. It's crazy. The mind yes. is powerful. I love it. It's so interesting. You know, our brain has not really evolved since we were living in caves and at that time we needed to be a little bit anxious to survive <laughs> right <laughs> yeah it was crazy and we couldn't just go happy go lucky even if there's not a lion and i'm going out <laughs> so the 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 most anxious people 
are those who survive the most and they pass on the gene. So a little bit of anxiety and tendency to notice the negative things is in our genes mm -hmm. and that's it. But life is not like back then. Right. We don't benefit from that approach. And so we need to train the mind to notice what is positive. Otherwise, we are going just to notice what is negative, which means you're going to imagine the worst case scenarios in your mind. You are hypnotizing yourself for the worst. And that is a little bit like sleepwalking instead of living with intention. Yeah. So tell people how they can find you if they want to um, meet yes. you and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that the easiest thing is to go on my website, which is mynamelastname.com. So it's lauraartero.com. Um, I post on Instagram, not very consistently. Sometimes I do it, sometimes <laughs> I don't. Uh, but you can find me there as well. Again, is my name, last name. Um, and yes, I, I would love to offer to all the uh, listeners that meditation that you mentioned at the beginning which is um an hypnotic meditation mm -hmm. and it helps you to understand um what kind of criticism is affecting you and how to change it so hopefully it will be uh of help oh yeah it's a great meditation it really i loved it i thought it was great i i was actually able to get in the zone and it works. So I need to just go back and keep listening to it because it was really good. But Laura, thank you so much. You're always welcome to come back. I love talking to you, thank you. <laughs> and um, you're just a bright light. I just love talking to you. You're so positive and hopefully people got a lot out of this, but otherwise we will stay in touch. So I will talk to you soon. Yes. Yes. Thank you very All much. Right. It was amazing. Uh, yes. Great service. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, let Bye. me find the record. Bye. <laughs>